Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming out today, most of you sitting towards the back there. Uh, I'm Tom Lenny. I'm the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture. <coughs> and I'm extremely happy today to introduce today's Thomas More lecturer in the humanities, Andrew Del Banco. The Thomas More series is the legacy of a gift to the college that enables us to explore ways that the humanities illuminate moral dilemmas, enhance our capacity for understanding and empathy, and help us to imagine more just ways of living. The topic of today's lecture, what is college for, is a question that many of our faculty here have a, given a good deal of thought to. It reminds me, I always say, of the cover of an old view book that I used to see. Some of you will remember this, and says, what am I doing here? Which says in much more uh, direct terms, maybe, uh, than, than, the, than the title we have. Several years ago, a dozen faculty colleagues and I were convened to ask, as a group, what we thought Je Jesuit liberal arts uh, stood for in the college. We developed a small brochure. I left some of those out on the table, uh, if you're curious. And uh, one of the most inter interesting books that we read at the time was a book called College, What It Was, Is, and Should Be by Andrew Del Banco of Columbia University. So I'm very happy to have him here to continue that conversation. In the years since our faculty discussion, the value of a liberal education has come under even further assault. Politicians from both parties have publicly doubted the value of liberal education compared to voc vocationally oriented education. Just last week at CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Conference, Education Secretary Betsy DeVos told an audience of college students that their professors were telling them what to do, what to say, to think, and that colleges and universities are part of the education establishment that her administration plans to fight. I, for one, think that liberal education is one of the cornerstones of a free and open democracy, and our distinguished speaker today, Andrew Del Banco, certainly disagrees with those critics. He suggested that in this climate, a liberal education may be more important than ever. Professor Del Banco is a scholar of American hist literary and religious history and the history of education. He is Alexander Hamilton, Professor of American Studies at Columbia University. That's a great title to have if you want to right now, especially. He's the author, as I mentioned, of College, What It Was, Is, and Should Be, published in 2012. In a White House ceremony in 2011, he received the National Humanities Medal from President Obama for his insight into American character, past and present. In 2001, Time Magazine named him America's best social critic for his essays on current issues in higher education. Professor Del Banco has also published extensively on American history and the place of classic authors in history in contemporary life. His books include Melville, His Life and Work, The Death of Satan, How Americans Have Lost a Sense of Evil, Required Reading, Why Are American Classics Matter Now, the Real American Dream, and The Puritan Ordeal. Now, he's a great writer, but he's also a great teacher, and he values teaching as a vocation and sees it as a moral activity. In 2006, he received the Great Teacher Award from the Society of Columbia Graduates. So I'm very grateful that he's here and would ask you to join me in welcoming Andrew Del Banco. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Is this machine making me audible? So um, first I should <clears throat> apologize for this gravelly voice that sounds to me like somebody other than myself is talking, but um, I hope it doesn't sound too awful to you, and I think it will hold out for the, uh, for the hour or so. Uh, and secondly, I appreciate the kind introduction and the warm welcome. The fact is, as some of you will probably figure out before the uh, evening is over, uh, I stand before you as a kind of uh, a proverbial Woody Allen character, the type that gets extremely nervous when I'm out, uh, more than a couple of miles away from New York City and the, I'm in a place where the streets are not numbered and so on. So, so I get a little off kilter when I'm out of town and I appreciate therefore all the kind hospitality and tolerance that you've already shown to me. Um, so I want to uh, begin this afternoon with a couple of images. Let's see if this works. Uh, there it is. Um, just, just two images. This is not going to be a sound and light show, but just a couple of images to get us started. Um, this uh, appeared <clears throat> uh, on the cover of Newsweek magazine, one of the last issues of Newsme Newsweek magazine that was actually printed on paper before it became an online publication. And um, as you can see, it's got this screaming headline, Is College a Lousy Investment? Which is a rather brutal way to put it, but it's a question 
as uh, Tom has already intimated, that's on a lot of people's minds, and it should be on people's minds. It's, I'm sure it's on the minds of students in this room who may have incurred some debt to come here, to parents who are making financial sacrifices in order to send their children to college. I wouldn't myself put it quite that way, but it's, it's a question of, you know, what exactly do I get for this investment? What can I expect for this investment? And um, what I want to do for about uh, two minutes is, a, you know, what the art historians call an iconographic analysis, or maybe that's too fancy. But I want to look at the imagery of this for a moment, because I think the imagery implicitly answers the question. Look at the grass. It's really well kept, nice piece of grass. I mean, it looks like the fairway of a, of a well-maintained private golf club, uh, at least to me. Um, which seems to suggest, you know, it, it backs up something that a lot of people believe today, that colleges are spending their money on the wrong things. They're spending their money on amenities and uh, luxuries that, uh, that students uh, don't uh, need to have. This, in fact, is a lie and a slander in most cases. The reality is that most undergraduates in our country attend overcrowded, underfunded public institutions where there are not a lot of amenities, you know, climbing walls and, uh, and lap pools and the sorts of things that we associate with elite private institutions. Uh, and then look at the young couple at the center of the picture. They're on extremely good terms with each other. They're very relaxed. Uh, they're strolling uh, toward this iconic classroom building. There's nobody else around. So it could be that they're getting there early. You know, maybe they're ahead of all their classmates. It could also be that they're late and they're unconcerned about it. Um, everybody else is already in the class. So that, too, I think, is sending a message. They're not concerned because we all know there's great inflation. So it doesn't matter whether they take their studies seriously or not. They're going to they're gonna have an A or an A+. Plus. Uh, uh, Im, you know, the images seem to say to me, you want to know what you're, what you're investing in when you send your kids to college? College is basically <clears throat> an expensive dating service for pampered students. Uh, and I, I put that image up there because I think it actually uh, speaks to an attitude that's very much out there. And all of us who are in education, administrators, teachers, uh, need to be aware of it and need to have answers for it. Last thing I want to say about this image before I go on to the second and last of the two images is that I showed it once at a gathering of college presidents. And when I got to the Q&A, as we will hear this afternoon in, in a bit, um, a gentleman in the back raised his hand. And I said, he said, that's my college. <laughs> and I was delighted because I really wanted I was curious what campus it is. Turns out it's in my city. <clears throat> it's in Long, uh, uh, Staten Island, a Wagner College on Staten Island. And uh, he, was, he was a very good-humored college president, uh, which is not always the case in my experience of college presidents. Uh, and he said, yeah, he said, my public affairs guy called me up. And he says, I got good news and I got bad news. <clears throat> the good news is that we're on the cover of Newsweek magazine. The bad news is we're now the poster child for everything that's wrong with American higher education. <laughs> All right. So image number two. There we go. Um, uh, this magazine <clears throat> landed in my hotel room a few years ago when I was staying in, guess where, Boston. Um, and this is an image that conveys what a lot, a lot of people's idea is about the answer to the first question. How are we going to constrain the costs of college? What is the college of the future going to look like? Indeed, in many respects, what does the college of the present already look like? So here's a young man, he's going to college, but in a virtual sense, right? He's in his pajamas. We have therefore, I have no idea what time it is. It could be uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it could be 2 o'clock in the morning. He's going to college according to his own biorhythms, not according to some registrar or the convenience of the faculty as to when they schedule classes in the old-fashioned sense that most of us are used to. Um, and, uh, and, he's, and he's going to college, of course, through, uh, through the portal of his computer. Uh, this came out at just the moment, many of you may be aware of it, but it's a craze that has already died down, so it may feel like ancient history. About four or five years ago, everybody was talking about MOOCs, right? Massive open online courses. It all began with a professor at Stanford, a computer science professor, who showed up for his class one day and looked at the, uh, whatever it was, 150 students in his introductory uh, artificial intelligence course and said to himself, you know, why am I doing this? If I took this course online, 
maybe I could reach more students. And it seems a little silly for me to be walking into the room physically and talking to these people actually face to face. So he took it online and he made a MOOC out of it. And sure enough, the enrollment in his course went from 150 to 150,000 all around the world. And suddenly we were reading all this, including from the president of Stanford, who's a, I think a good guy, but got a little carried away, that um, that the the MOOC and the the uh, the Click University was going to replace the Brick University. There was going to be, he said, a tsunami that was going to come and wash away traditional institutions like yours and mine, because people were going to be able to go online and get the best possible quality instruction at a much lower cost. You don't have to be an economics major to figure out that it's much more cost effective if you can pay one guy to instruct 150,000 students than if you have to pay a faculty member to instruct 15 in a seminar or even 150 in a lecture course. So everybody got very excited about that as the wave of the future and this magazine cover came out at just that moment and I think in contrast to the Newsweek cover, <clears throat> the imagery around it is all extremely positive. Look at his breakfast. He's eating, I don't know if you can see it that well, but he's eating what looks to me like a bowl of high fiber cereal, no doubt with skim milk, maybe no milk at all, you know, quite different from the jelly donut that I stuffed in my face this morning before I went to class. Um, he's got a mug on the table that says Harvard on it. So he's got high academic aspirations. He's left-handed. Um, how many left-handers have we got in the room? Very, very few, okay, three or four, but those three, you three or four, you know, of course, that there's lots of data to suggest that left-handers are intellectually superior and more creative <laughs> than right-handers, though as I, being a right-hander, I've always resisted that uh, inference. In any case, but that's, there's an implication there that there's something special about this guy. And then under the table is the universal symbol of domestic tranquility and love and devotion and so on. Um, so, you know, there's everything right about this picture, uh, and um, at least that's the way it's supposed to be. Now, I, you won't be surprised, think there's some stuff wrong with it. First of all, he's alone. Now, the younger folks in the audience tonight may push back against that proposition, and I understand, if you do, that since many people now conduct their social lives through that portal and through social media and so on. There's a sense in which he may be connected to his friends, but he's not in, in a physical space with another person. And another thing about it uh, suggests to me is that if we're honest with ourselves, he's going for his education to the same place where he goes for entertainment, where he goes to go shopping, and where he goes, if, if we're really candid with ourselves, where most people at one time or another go to check out pornography. So an implication of this picture, which I don't think was in the mind of those who put it together, is that the, that the historical boundary line between the academy as a place apart from the world, as a place that you step into by stepping out of the world, for at least a period of time in your lives, that that may be over. That the world of the of a higher education is no longer demarcated in a clear way from the rest of our lives and experience. And there's some good things about that, I think, and we could talk about that a little bit later. But there's some striking, anyway, it's a striking change. And, and there, as I said, or to begin with, this is meant to be a picture of the future, but the reality is it's already a picture of the present, right? I mean, we're all wired 24-7. Um, there are many institutions, maybe including this one, that make courses available online for students whose schedules in one way or another don't allow them to come to class. Um, so it's, it's not so much a vision of the future, even though the MOOCs have died down, as it is of the present. Now, I told, they told me to point this thing. There we go. And it worked. Okay, enough with the pictures. Um, I show you <clears throat> these pictures as a sort of prelude to what I want to really talk about this afternoon, which is the past. Uh, and I hasten to say that it's not my intention to glorify the past, uh, though I have some nice things to say about it. I don't um, uh, want to talk to you about the past because I think we could or should go back to it, which is obviously impossible. The past is as they say, another country. Nobody, as far as I know, has invented the time machine yet. 
but because as we find ourselves <clears throat> ineluctably pushed into the future by very large forces that are almost entirely beyond our control, and by our, I, I mean even the most powerful institutions seem to be swept up in a tide that is carrying them all toward some destination that they may not necessarily want to go to. As we are traveling into the future, um, it seems to me it's a good idea to know something about the past. The past of the uh, American educational ideals as manifested in this institution called college so that we can make or try to make some reasonable decisions about what to jettison from the past and what to try to hold on to and adapt for the future as we move forward. So, in speaking about the past of uh, American uh, higher education, college in particular, conveniently enough, we know when and where it began. It began in the third decade of the 17th century, about, uh, what, 45 miles east of here or so, in a town that was called Newtown by the Puritan settlers who arrived in Massachusetts Bay uh, at that time, and then became known as Cambridge in honor of the University of Cambridge from which many of them uh, uh, had graduated. And there's a document that they produced uh, just a very, few short number of years after their arrival in, in New England, um, which could be safely described as the first mission statement in the history of American higher education, and also the first fundraising brochure. That is, they wrote something to their Puritan colleagues back in Old England who had chosen for one reason or another not to go on this adventure with them, and said, listen, we need money to start a college. We need you to send uh, contributions. And one of them, a guy named John Harvard, sent his library, and that's why the place is called Harvard. And there's one book left from that library because all the rest of them burned up in a fire in the, in the 18th century. So I want to read you one sentence from that mission statement because it's a sentence that I really love and I just like reading it, <laughs> but I think it also is pertinent to our topic. After God had carried us safe to New England and we had built our houses, provided necessaries for our livelihood, reared convenient places for God's worship and settled the civil government, one of the next things we longed for and looked after was to advance learning. And I put a deliberate emphasis on that word advance because I want to say a little bit about what it meant to them and what it has meant since. To advance learning and perpetuate it to posterity, dreading to leave an illiterate ministry to the churches when our present ministers shall lie in the dust. And as I say, I, I, I'm always moved by that s statement. It, it has a quality that I think durable texts have. It's both about its moment and it also expresses a timeless truth, which is that all educational institutions, from the pre-K uh, program in New York City that my daughter is working on behalf of at the moment, to, uh, to the research university, are, if I could put it this way, they're about trying to cheat death. They are about our effort to pass on what we know, what mistakes we've made, uh, to the younger generation, and some, and some truths perhaps that we've discovered, to the younger generation so that that knowledge won't disappear with us when we're no longer capable of articulating it and transmitting it. That sounds perhaps very banal and self-evident, but it's a feeling one gets, it'll be a, just a couple months from now, on this campus uh, uh, in the fall, maybe more than a couple months, especially in the fall, when the leaves are coming off the trees and the parents are leaving their kids at, at, at school for the first time, especially the first year students, you get this feeling, you get it again at commencement when parents are watching their children walk down the aisle to get their diploma and they're watching them, I can assure you as a parent who once experienced this, through a screen of memories of what we were like when we were 19 or 20 or 22 years old. There's that generational passing on that is what a college um, uh, is all about. Now, I said I want to talk about the word advance. They speak about advancing knowledge. What did they mean by it? They meant a number of different things, but I think primarily they meant spreading knowledge. 
evangelizing for knowledge. The fact is, with all the problems and defect, defects that they had that we're well aware of today, those folks who came to New England in the early 17th century were committed to the idea of sustaining a society, a community, with an extremely high literacy level. They believed that everybody should have access to the word. And, 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 and that was part of their Protestant commitment, that the word of God should not be mediated for, the, for, the, for lay people by uh, an educated expert class, a, priest, a priestly class, but that everyone should be able to read the word in the vernacular for themselves so that they could have an unmediated relationship with God and the truth. That doesn't mean they didn't think people needed guidance from an educated clergy, but they were committed to the idea of literacy for everyone, and uh, within the limits of what they understood to be everyone, they did pretty well with that. Um, now, this, of course, was not, strictly speaking, uh, did not remain a Puritan or Protestant or New England idea. It became an American idea. So, um, Mr. Jefferson, for instance, was committed to the proposition that you cannot have a republic without an educated citizenry. Uh, now, his own idea of citizenship, as I hardly need to remind you, was extremely straightened. Um, women didn't qualify for citizenship in his mind. Uh, immigrants didn't qualify for citizenship. We seem to be redoing, re, 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 replaying that debate. Um, African Americans he could not imagine as full-fledged citizens of this new republic that he, uh, that he envisioned. And yet, I think, again, allowing for uh, the limitations of his time and place and of his imagination, this conception that you cannot have a republic without an educated citizenry is, is, is showing itself to be more important and, I think, more true uh, than ever before. It's the reason that uh, Jefferson, who served as President of the United States, wrote the Declaration of Independence. The proudest achievement of his life was his founding of the University of Virginia, a great public institution which would identify uh, talented people from all walks of life, at least so far as he could imagine such a thing, and give them the education to make them uh, virtuous citizens. Now, this idea that one should spread knowledge as widely as possible became uh, a, a cardinal distinctive idea of American culture for a century and more to come. Uh, you can Fast forward to the middle of the Civil War, when the Congress of the United States somehow found enough resources and enough focus and attention uh, to pass something called the Morrill Act, which created the land-grant colleges, which became the great public state universities uh, that uh, made it possible for a larger uh, segment of the population to achieve a, a post-secondary education than any society uh, previously in history. You go, you go uh, a, a century further than that and you come to the midst or just right after another devastating war, the Second World War, and you come to another act of Congress, the GI Bill, which made it possible for young men whose fathers <clears throat> would have been able to walk onto the campuses of, of uh, the, the old venerable institutions in this country or even the not so venerable institutions would have walked onto those campuses only perhaps as delivery boys or as members of the janitorial staff. And yet their sons, by, through government subsidies, could, could attend any college that would, it, would admit them and, and obtain a, a, a post-secondary education. A little bit further than that, you go into the 1950s and you come up to the uh, extraordinary creativity of a guy in California named Clark Kerr who created the California Plan. That is a three-tiered system of public institutions with community colleges and state colleges and then the great research universities at the top of the, at the, top of the pyramid that virtually guaranteed a college education to every high school graduate in the state of California for a nominal fee. So whatever you may think of the politics and the economics of it at the moment, when Senator Sanders was running as part of his platform on the idea of free college for all 
And people said, He's a, this is a pipe dream, this, this is never going to happen. It did happen. It was happening about uh, a little more than a half a century uh, ago. And um, the private institutions like the one that I work in uh, may have made, I think, in my view, a too modest contribution to this uh, history by um, opening the doors to the children of needy families and providing financial aid based on need. This institution, of course, made a college education available to children from Catholic families who were excluded from the old uh, uh, Protestant institutions like the one that I was talking about earlier pretty, pretty systematically for a very long time. So uh, all kinds of institutions have participated in this expanding story of educational opportunity. As a literary type, I like to frame it between two quotations, one from my favorite writer, Herman Melville, who you may remember even if you've only read just a little way into Moby Dick, when young Ishmael is thinking about signing up for this whaling voyage on the Pequod, and he sort of interviews with the owners of the Pequod, and they pick up the fact that he's heard some rumors about this really weird captain, Captain Ahab, and that may be giving him second thoughts about whether he really wants to go on this voyage. Uh, one of them says to him, he says, yes, he says, Ahab has been in colleges as well as among the cannibals. <laughs> Which I love that line, a lot of lines in Melville I love, but I love that line because it kind of, you know, it captures a, a lot of sociological truth and also that you had to be really weird to go to college in 1850. Uh, a tiny, tiny percentage of the population went to college, and it was about as exotic and strange to most ordinary people as going to live among cannibals. Um, now, you go 100 years <clears throat> past that to Arthur Miller's great uh, play at the end of the Second World War, uh, All My Sons. And there's a character in that play um, a suburban dad who's sitting on the porch, who's only been to high school, which was in those days pretty much the, the credential you needed to enter into the middle class. And he looks out and he says, you stand on the street corner today and, and spit and you'll hit a college man. That is, they're everywhere. And he says this with a mixture of kind of patriotic pride, but also resentment that they, you know, people think they're, you're, you're no good if you haven't been to college. Anyway, the point is, um, this story uh, of expansion, expanding educational opportunity was a dynamic and powerful one for a very long time. Now, how are we doing on this today? You could probably tell by the rhetorical question that the answer is not very well. In California, that I alluded to a few minutes ago, you have hundreds of thousands of young people, particularly first-generation aspiring college goers, children of immigrants, and of course, uh, uh, undocumented immigrants, uh, the ones that we're fighting over right now with the uh, DACA uh, debate, who cannot get into the classes that they need in the community college system because the resources to teach them are just not there. The faculty are not there. The physical spaces are not there. Mr. Jefferson's University, University of Virginia, anybody want to take a guess as to what percentage of its annual operating budget today is covered by public funds? It's a public institution. Five is about what it was last time I checked, 5%. In other words, the University of Virginia, like all the great flagship public institutions, is really a public university in name only is raising billions of dollars in endowment funds, It's taking more and more students from out of state and out of the country in order to collect tuition dollars that it needs in order to keep its operation going. Here are some more numbers that were accurate around the time I wrote this little book, and I suspect <clears throat> that they've only gotten worse since. That is that in today's America, if your family makes more than $90,000 a year, your odds of getting a college degree by age 24 are roughly one in two. That's not bad. That probably compares pretty favorably to much of the rest of the world. If your family income is between 60 and 90,000, your odds are roughly one in four. And if you come from a family where the family income is less than $35,000 a year, your odds are about one in 17. I would guess that that's now around one in 20. 
Another way to put those numbers in some context is to say what one scholar who knows about these things uh, said to me, that l low income kids with very high test scores and high school GPAs are graduating from college in our country at about the same rate as high income kids with very low test scores and low high school GPAs, which suggests that there's something going on here other than a meritocratic sorting process. I mean, the only way I think you can defend these numbers, and some people would defend them, uh, or say that they're not really relevant to the pressing questions, is to suggest that money is distributed in our society pretty much the same way as intelligence, talent, aspiration are distributed. My guess is that most of you don't believe that, and um, I certainly don't. Now, um, OK, so this is a picture of uh, where we are, which is to say we are sliding backward in this regard. And then the question arises, as it should, so what? Why does it matter that fewer people have this opportunity than one would think in an ideal circumstance they should have? Why? What is the reason to care that college the opportunity for a college experience should be more broadly available. And I would suggest to you that the almost uh, universal answer to that question, whether you're listening to somebody from the left or the right or in the, in the shrinking center, uh, is um, an economic one. That is, there's good data that show that people who have even some college education tend, of course, they're always outliers one way or the other, tend to do better in, our, in, in, the, in the market economy than people without college experience. Uh, naysayers like to cite, you know, Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg, who both dropped out of college. There are not that many Gateses and Zuckerbergs. It's a very bad, if, if you have the choice of going to college or not going to college, and you're thinking about improving your odds to make a decent living in your life, even there's even evidence that correlates college attendance with better health outcomes and more family stability later, later in life. It's a very bad bet to bet that you're going to do as well or better by not going. And um, it is also true, and you hear this argument as well, that college going is important for our country in order to keep us a competitive society because other societies are making big investments. The Chinese are making huge investments in their universities, that if we're going to have a population that can compete in the global knowledge economy, as it is often described, we need to have a literate and even perhaps more important today, numerate population. And that what you get in, through high school is not good enough. Um, all of those arguments are legitimate and, 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 and quite defensible, and they have increasing urgency at a time when people feel the kinds of economic stresses that so many people feel. But as you would probably not be surprised, I want to talk about some other reasons. Some other reasons that I think you almost never hear articulated in public discourse. And I can understand why politicians don't articulate them, but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be articulated and that they aren't important. The first is the peculiarly American idea, and when you get right down to it, college, in the sense that I'm using the word, is a peculiarly American institution. That is, this idea of a four-year interval between the uh, rather regimented, regulated, and more and more regulated uh, K through 12 educational experience when you are still living at home or in one way or another directly under the supervision of your family and the, the post-college experience which broadly speaking we like to think of as adulthood. That there's this interval and we actually created an institution to accommodate young people during this interval. Now this leaves a lot out because a lot, a lot of more and more students are actually what we call now non-traditional students, older students. We could talk about that later if you like. But this, this basic concept that there should be such an institution is, is a hardcore American idea that I think we should be 
uh, loath to abandon. Um, I like to cite Melville in this context again. He says early in Moby Dick, he says, a whale ship was my Yale College and my Harvard. A whale ship was my Yale College and my Harvard. What did he mean? He meant, yes, it was a place, as so many people tend to think of a college first and foremost, a place that he acquired skills. He went to sea. He knew how, he, there was nothing he knew how to do. By the time he came back after four years, there were lots of things he knew how to do, many of which he couldn't even imagine needed doing before he went to sea. And it's also true that he got, a, he got himself a fairly traditional uh, literary and historical education while he was at sea because those ship's libraries were surprisingly well stocked and he was a tremendous self uh, autodidact and he read lots of books while he was at sea. So those things uh, are certainly um, true. Um, it also means that uh, he encountered people, and this is what we now subsume under the term diversity, he encountered people that he would never have met, come across in life, if he had stayed within the Boston of his father's family or the New York of his mother's family. People from, of different religions, of different colors, different languages, um, different orientations of all kinds. But most of all, to my mind, I think, if you read that book, it means that he spent a lot of time way up high on the masthead. There's that great chapter called The Masthead, in, in, from which he contemplates the vast Pacific, which is a pretty good metaphor for the universe itself, and asks himself, why am I, to go to that brochure, what am I doing here? Why am I here? And what meaning does my life have in this vast universe that seems pretty indifferent to my existence? And if, in fact, it doesn't have a meaning which has been placed in, in it, then how can I give it meaning? How can I make meaning? It seems to me that those are the questions that were then at the center of what the ideal college experience could could and should have been, um, and still are. The second thing, and I've already alluded to it with that word diversity, uh, that's, that's unusual about the American college is that it, it really is unusual. And many of you probably have European friends, and if you're, if you're in the faculty, you have scholarly colleagues at European institutions. Um, this distinctive, if not unique, idea that students have important things to learn not only from their professors and their textbooks and their laboratory experiments, but from each other. That there's actually a reason to bring students together um, who are from different backgrounds, have different convictions. Uh, we tend to think of it these days somewhat narrowly in terms of racial diversity, which is important, the kind of diversity that for a long time we excluded. But there are all kinds of diversity that are, I think, important for a student's education. Now, we talk about this all the time in the abstract. What does it mean concretely? What I, all I can say to you, and I'm sure you all have your own thoughts about this, what, is, what does it mean to me as a teacher? Well, when I'm teaching, as I've done a couple times, <clears throat> the Homer's great war poem, The Iliad, in the Columbia Great Books curriculum. And that's what it is. It's a war poem. And I've got one student who is pretty typical of the class, who the closest he's been to war is to have watched a few war movies on the flat screen TV in his parents' uh, basement. And I've got another student, which I, I had a few years ago, who was a paratrooper in Iraq during the first, first Gulf War. They're reading a different book, totally different book. And if they talk to each other, which is what one hopes will happen in a well-functioning class, they might actually learn something from each other. It's not the fault of the first guy that he hasn't been to war, and it's not necessarily meritorious, uh, the, or certainly not the only kind of merit to say, I've, I've served in the military. But they're coming from to two totally different experiences, and it's helpful to put them together rather than keep them apart. Or which is more typical of what I do if I'm teaching the uh, autobiography of Ben Franklin, or the speeches of Abraham Lincoln, two figures who really believed in what we 
call for shorthand purposes the American dream. That is the idea that by hard work and self-reliance, you can elevate yourself above the station in which you were born. Um, and I've got uh, one student who's been flipping hamburgers every summer at McDonald's in order to make a contribution to the tuition and uh, supplement the financial aid grant. And I've got another student who spends every summer working on his sun suntan at the family beach house in uh, Mallorca or wherever it may be. They are also reading different books. And it is also better for both of them and better for the class um, if they uh, talk to each other. The third thing about college, <clears throat> and it seems to me this doesn't require too much uh, uh, argumentation in the present moment, is that the college classroom, when it's working well, is what I like to call the best rehearsal space we have for democracy. It's a pl and this is true whether it's a science class or a, or a social science class or a humanities class. It's a place where students <clears throat> learn to speak with civility, listen with respect, learn the difference between an opinion, which is something that, you know, you've imbibed from somebody that you like or somebody you're intimidated by or some elder member of the family or whatever it may be or your peer group, and an argument, which is something that of which you should be able to persuade somebody else by the uh, presentation of evidence. Most of all, the college classroom, therefore, should be a place where you can walk in with one point of view and walk out with another, or at least with some productive doubt about what you were sure of when you arrived. So I, re I don't think I need to belabor why this is so important. All the issues that, that divide us, you can pick from whatever one from the list you want. Uh, uh, does the Second Amendment protect the right to bear arms for citizens? I mean, you can go to Walmart and buy a semi-automatic weapon and if they, everybody should have that right? Or did the Second Amendment have in mind the main maintenance of a militia in the face of the possibility of an invading army from Britain and therefore it's insane for any civilian to be allowed to get anywhere near such a weapon? It's, we probably all have strong views of that question it's not that simple a question. The question of charter schools. Are charter schools uh, a way of opening up opportunity to kids and families who've been shut out by a decaying public system? Or are they the death knell, driving the nail into the coffin for a public education system that's the backbone of a democratic society? Uh, nuclear energy, is it our best chance to free ourselves from dependence on fossil fuels? Or is it Armageddon waiting to happen, as almost happened in Japan a few uh, years ago? Or the very difficult question of, of abortion. Is it, is it the work of Satan to, uh, to give a woman the right to choose what to do with uh, an early term fetus? Or is it a form of abuse to the woman to tell her that we, the government, the church, or whatever supervening entity it may be, will tell you what's right and what's wrong in this situation. These are all hard questions. And we've done a really lousy job, by and large, somewhat better with some than with others, at finding some kind of, if not common ground, middle ground where we can agree to live with one another uh, in, in a state of disagreement. Um, I'm tempted, I don't want to be making political speeches, but I'm tempted to say that anybody who watched the quasi State of the Union address last night, uh, it would be, it's really helpful if you can listen to some of the things that the president said with some critical skepticism uh, and think about some of the contradictory aspects of that speech. Um, the, uh, well, on one minute, um, making, noises of welcoming immigrants and, and honoring the immigrant contribution to American society, and then at the next minute announcing that there's going to be a whole special category of, of uh, special task force for uh, protecting us from violent crime committed by uh, illegal immigrants. And illegal immigrants do commit violent crimes, but at a slightly lower rate than uh, legal immigrants and citizens last time I checked. So 
In other words, I don't mean to pick on the president. You can, you can pick whatever politician you want from either party. We need a citizenry that can listen to the arguments and not just go with the tone. I don't like the tone, so I don't like him, or I do like the tone, so I like him. That's not good enough if we're going to sustain a functioning uh, democracy. Now, um, I said earlier that I wanted to revert to that word advance. Uh, I do want to revert to it. Um, it's a word that we have, those of us in the humanities and the humanistic disciplines, have almost entirely ceded, I think, to our colleagues in the natural sciences. And I have only the highest regard for my colleagues in the natural sciences. Some of my best friends are natural scientists. Um, but let me try to illustrate what I mean by this to try to just bring into focus one element of what I think is going on in contemporary American higher education. If you jump 200 years past those Puritan founders of Harvard, you get, it takes 200, more than 200 years, you get to the first president of Harvard who was not a clergyman after the Civil War. His name was Eliot, Charles W. Eliot, descendant of those Puritans, but he was a scientist. He was a chemist. And at his inaugural address, I think it was his inaugural address, he articulated his view of the function of the university, and he put it this way. It, is, it exists for storing up the accumulated knowledge of the race, by which he meant the human race, so that each successive generation of youth shall start with all the advantages which their predecessors have won. Let's just pause on that for a moment. I, I call this disrespectfully the relay race theory of knowledge. Uh, that is, and it, it, it speaks to what I said at the beginning about transmitting and passing on knowledge, right? You take, uh, you take learning as far as you can take it. You push back the darkness of ignorance as far as you can push it back. You come to a deeper understanding of natural phenomena of one kind or another, and then you leave the scene, you leave the stage, and the next generation can start where you stopped. They don't have to start over again. And that insight is undoubtedly true, and it's, it's a powerful truth that explains the power of Western science, and I think explains the advantage that our colleagues in the, in the natural sciences have over the mushy-headed humanists like me in making the case for the value of what they do, because we all know it's true. If it weren't true, it would not be the case that a 16 or 17-year-old bright math student from Worcester High uh, can, uh, can understand a good deal about the calculus. Whereas in the 17th century, when these institutions were founded, there were only two people in the world who knew anything about the calculus, and one of them was Isaac Newton. They had to imagine it. They had to imagine it out of nothing, almost like God created the universe out of, out of, out of nothingness or chaos. Now, does that mean that the kid who gets the five on the math AP is the next Isaac Newton? Probably not. Maybe one of them will be. What it means is they've got a good textbook, a good teacher, the Khan Academy. Some of you may be in this situation, right? So that you can learn what somebody else developed, discovered, devised. If it weren't true, it wouldn't be the case, and we know it is the case, that a third-year medical student at UMass Medical School now knows more about the genetic basis of disease or human organ transplantation than the dean of the medical school knew 50 years ago. That's how science works. It is progressive in that sense. And the evidence of that pro progressiveness uh, is all around us. I like to illustrate this with your indulgence by reminiscing for two or three minutes about my father's life, okay? My father was born in the year 1909, and he lived a long life. He lived till 1997. So he would tell me that he could remember as a child the milkman arriving with a horse-drawn cart and delivering bottles of milk to his parents' house. He could remember the installation in his parents' house of the first telephone, which was a big box that you cranked up and then you sort of shouted into it, 
and then somebody called an operator. You see this in old movies, right? Somebody called an operator would answer, and she had things to plug into holes in the wall and could connect you to somebody else on the other side of town who had such a box in their house, and after a while to somebody in another city and even another country, and so on and so forth. He remembers the first uh, heavier-than-air flying machines. And he lived long enough to see men walking on the moon to have one of these smartphones in his pocket so that he could not only talk to people, but you, I mean, pretty soon we all know uh, the iPhone 12 or 15 or 27 or whatever it's going to be. We're not only going to be able to hear them and see them as we already can, we'll be able to smell them and taste them and touch them, I'm sure, uh, through, through, through these devices. So he saw this incredible, uh, uh, progress, all of which, I mean, I'm talking about technology, which is a byproduct of science, but all of this is really good argumentative evidence on behalf of those who want to make the case that we, we need to teach the natural sciences uh, in our colleges. And I, I, you know, look, I'm a baby boomer, which means I'm a member of the first generation where I could go to the beach in the summertime. If I came home with a flush, my mother wasn't worried that I had contracted polio because these two guys, Dr. Salk and Sabin, who competed with each other over who had the better vaccine, came up with something, and one day there was a polio, ter there was terror of polio in every American family, and like the next day, nobody cared anymore. These are amazing achievements, and I can, you know, we could, we could all come up with multiple examples to make the point. Now, I told you when my father was born, but I didn't tell you where. He was born in Hamburg, Germany. And despite the Italian-sounding last name, he was born into a German-Jewish family, which meant that when he was approximately college age, suddenly that society around, around him descended into a barbarism that even the most creative medieval poets and painters could not possibly have imagined. And he ran for his life, literally, as did the rest of the family, and by the end of the century, uh, all the way, which he lived almost all the way through, more human beings had been murdered by other human beings in the name of some religious or racial or political ideology than in all the previous centuries of human existence combined. So what does that mean? I mean, what, how do you put together all this great evidence of progress with this other thing that one can't deny happened and that forms of it are still happening, as I don't uh, need to remind you. I don't know what it means. It does mean, I think, that some aspects of human experience don't fit well into the advanced paradigm, into the progress paradigm. It means that in the humanistic disciplines, it makes no sense. I mean, it means a lot of things, but one thing it means is it makes no sense to say James Joyce's novel Ulysses is a more advanced work than Homer's poem The Odyssey, or that Stravinsky's Rite of Spring is a more advanced and developed work than Bach's B minor mass. It makes no sense to think that way in the humanistic disciplines, and even though I'm not a Christian in any technical sense, it suggests to me that when we read, say, St. Augustine writing about original sin, it could be that what he has to say is as pertinent and true for our experience as it was then. We may have a different vocabulary, we may put it in a different context, but the insights are not disp disp disposable the way uh, um, t uh, Ptolemy might be or even certain aspects of Newtonian physics might be. It doesn't work that way in the humanistic sciences or whatever it is we want to call them. I, I would say, just on a personal note, that this, this kind of came home to me vividly, perhaps uh, not for the first time, but most vividly, when I was teaching my Columbia students uh, uh, an English translation, because I don't read Greek, uh, uh, Homer's uh, Iliad. And you come to this passage in which Homer is describing how the Trojan soldiers overrun their Greek enemies. They streamed over in massed formation with Apollo in front of them, holding the aegis, and they wrecked the bastions of the Greeks easily, as when a little, this is the goosebump moment for me, 
as when a little boy piles sand by the seashore, when in his innocent play he makes sand towers to amuse him, and then, still playing with hands and feet, ruins them and wrecks them. So I'm reading this in a classroom on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, right? And I'm thinking, geez. So several thousand years ago, little Greek boys on the shore of the Aegean did exactly the same thing. They built sand castles, and then they got a big kick out of destroying them. Exactly the same way little boys are doing on Jones Beach, or Virginia Beach, or Hilton Head, or Revere Beach, or wherever you want right now. That's some kind of a datum, I think, about something that some people are reluctant to talk about, which we tend to subsume under the term uh, human nature. So the, the humanities, liberal education, which, of course, uh, uh, brings under the canopy the natural sciences as well, always has. There's, this, there's a false distinction that some people like to make between them. When they say liberal education, people in a defensive mood in my world seem to mean only literary studies or only for the study of philosophy. But uh, they say that because we feel under siege. We feel in our society today with all the well, well understood reasons to be concerned about the economic value of your education, of your degree, that it's a lot harder for us to make the case for what we do than it is for the folks in IT or in engineering or in some aspect of the health sciences to make the case for what they do. Um, and so, I mean, so why do I speak and write about this stuff? Because I think uh, it behooves us to try to make the case that um, we want not to give up on this dimension of uh, education. I will close by offering you a passage that um, jumped out at me on a, when I was in the library of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill looking for something entirely different and nothing to do with my work on higher education and I came upon a manuscript diary kept by a student at a small Methodist college in Virginia in 1850. Same moment that Melville is writing Moby Dick. And this student has been, he's come back to his dorm room having attended a lecture, really a sermon, by the college president. The primary responsibility of the college president almost all the way through the 19th century in almost all colleges that I know anything about was to give what we would call the senior capstone course, the course in moral philosophy, which was supposed to bring together everything that the student had learned in the natural sciences and in, in the classical studies and in everything and give them a, a, a structure and a synthesis for that student to take out into the world with him. And the, co the college president was the senior academic officer who was invested with the responsibility for teaching that course. So the president of this college, Methodist College, was undoubtedly giving what we would uh, experience more as a sermon uh, than as a lecture. And th whatever he said in that lecture, and one could speculate pretty much what it was, he probably talked about sin talked about the necessity for arriving at a, an honest assessment of one's own sinfulness. Um, whatever he said, it shook up this young man. And he wrote in his diary right just before graduation. Some of you may be looking at graduating this semester, and you may have some of these kind of feelings. He wrote in the diary a couple sen uh, 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 one sentence uh, that strikes me, that struck me then and has continued to strike me since as the best one-sentence definition of what a college should be that I've ever encountered. Oh, that the Lord would show me how to think and how to choose. How to think and how to choose. Not all of us would put the word the Lord into that sentence, but the idea that a true college should be an aid to reflection, a place and process whereby young people take stock of their talents and passions and begin to sort out their lives in a way that's true to themselves and responsible to others, how to think and how to choose, I can't do any better than that. And I think we don't want to let that go. We really don't want to let that go. Thank you very much.
Thank you. And I'm, it's, uh, I got no immediate appointment, so I'm perfectly happy to stick around for some comments or questions. Yes. Well, it's a great question. I mean, I, and I'm glad you asked it because it's easy to be misunderstood and su to suggest that college and classroom are you know, like synonyms. Uh, and in fact, uh, I, I trace a lot of these ideals back to the Puritan founders of these uh, con congregational institutions in New England. And they were, they insisted on the residential aspect of the college. Uh, Cotton Mather in, in his, uh, History of New England, the Magnalia Christi Americana, and he reviews the founding of Harvard, and he says something like, you know, in, on, on the continent, students live here and there in the university towns, which is still the case in most continental Europe. You know, you attend lectures, but you live where, wherever you live, in the boarding house, the rooming house, at home, whatever. And, and, and uh, Mather says, in New England, we prefer the collegiate way. Collegium, community, students living together so that the experience of encountering others is not just in the classroom when you're discussing one text or another, but is also in one's life. Now, we all know that dorm life is not always so exalted and <laughs> that there are other uh, attractions to it uh, than, than what Cotton Mather had in mind. And, Dorm life was pretty strictly supervised in those days, although if you, one of the amusing things about uh, rummaging around in the history of college is that you find out that the sort of things that we think are unique now, you know, students drinking too much and food fights and uh, uh, uglier things than that uh, are nothing new. But the idea of the residential college is, of course, also not an American, it's an Anglo-American idea. And the difference was that in England, it was restricted to this very small sector of the elite in two institutions, Oxford and Cambridge. And in America, we tried to democratize it. Now, the reality is we can't, I mean, we've got almost 20 million students in post-secondary institutions today. And as a, a authority on the subject once said in my presence, if you put all the students attending a residential liberal arts college like this one together, they would fit into one Big Ten football stadium. It's a little misleading because there are also residential colleges inside research universities like in my place. But the pure residential four-year college is a very select, uh, serves a very select few, about 100,000 out of almost 20 million. Um, and that's a a problem that people in the community college world are trying to wrestle with. But anyway, long answer to a good short question. Yes. Yeah, look, the cost problem is a huge problem, and I'm not an expert in the economics of higher education, but I know enough to know that it's much more, and I'm not saying you're uh, offering up a conventional and sim over overly simplified view, but the problem is much more complex than that magazine cover that I first showed you tries to suggest. First of all, <clears throat> the biggest driver of the rise in, in price, not as opposed to cost, in the price of higher education for families and students has been the public disinvestment in higher education. That is, the cost of educating students in public universities, which serve something like three quarters of the undergraduates in our country, has not, in fact, increased so rapidly. It has increased for some of the reasons that you state, but also for lots of other reasons, government regulation, um, the Title IX uh, issues where you need to have people handling all that stuff, student uh, mental health uh, issues that require counseling staff, also investments in college athletics, which uh, alumni seem to love. So there are lots and lots of factors, and there are also, there's also, that's why the people were so excited about the technological fix that, you know, maybe we could solve this problem by putting it all online because it's too damn expensive to hire all these faculty to teach just a relatively small number of students at a time because what happens in the classroom is, after all, finally not so different from what happened in the classroom 100 years ago. There are no uh, efficient uh, economies of scale, uh, efficient technological efficiencies. You can, you can make cars with robots, but you can't teach students with robots unless you believe that that's the future, slide two. So there are a lot of reasons, but, but the picture is, is pretty complicated. I mean, the sticker price, which everybody likes to cite, oh my God, it costs you know, $65,000 to go to Ivy League University A. The reality is that 
my university is slipping in this regard, but at, at, the, at the wealthiest Ivy League universities, something like 55 or 60 or even more percent of the students are receiving at least some amount of financial aid. And many of them are going for next to nothing. For those students who are paying the full freight, they overwhelmingly come from families that might not like to write the check, but have no problem writing the check. So it's, it's, a, it, it, it's a misleading picture. It's, it's, it's only probably about, I think last time I checked, about 2% of American under, families paying for kids to go to college who pay a sticker price in that, in that stratospheric area. So it's a problem, but it has also been used as a club to beat the higher education uh, system, I think, a, a little bit too, too severely. Now, the competitive thing that you alluded to is also clearly a huge problem. We've got to have the best gym facility. We've got to have the winningest football team. We've got to have the best student center, because otherwise the students are going to go to the public university down the road, or they're going to go to another private university that has made the investments that we haven't made. There are very few places that have held the line on that. And um, I don't know what to say about that. I, mean, I would like to see some, uh, and there are some, co courageous academic leaders who stand up and say, look, if you want to go to a place with all these amenities and all the uh, whistle, uh, what, what's the phrase, drums and whistles? Bells and whistles, thank you. I'm losing it here a little. And, you know, that's fine, but don't, that we're, not your, we're not the place for you. And it's not the end of the world if our selectivity uh, drops a little bit. Now, of course, that's easy for me to say, coming to a, from a place where there are thousands and thousands of students, more thousands of students who want to come than we can take. And I don't know what the deal is at Holy Cross at the moment, but I assume that you're also not hurting for a customer base. Um, and then how to calibrate your, I mean, which I'm sure is a topic of hot debate and discussion on your campus, uh, how to calibrate the benefits to the institution for having more full fee paying students and the obligation of the institution to serve students from families who can't afford to pay. These are not easy issues and I'm just a kibitzer, you know. I just say there are these problems and then I leave it to the presidents and the provosts and the trustees to figure out how to solve the problems. Um, but my, my main response is it ain't simple. And it's not quite, it's not, you know, politicians, some politicians, you know, you're being outrageously irresponsible that it costs so much. Can't you contain your costs? Turns out that the main cost containment strategy in American higher education in the last quarter century is to, is to hire part-time faculty, contingent faculty, so that the full-time and tenured faculty is a smaller and smaller percentage of the overall faculty workforce. That's not a good way to go. Not that some of the adjuncts, I'm sure you have them here and I have them, are wonderful, wonderful committed teachers, but they can't possibly give themselves to the same degree to the students because they are running between this campus and another campus trying to make a living. So that's a tough situation. The best solution would be a growing economy. Uh, but if I knew how to make that happen, I'd have a different job. Yes. I don't know how you make a persuasive argument on behalf of liberal education in the broadest sense to someone who has not had one. And that is a huge problem because it's not a winning argument to go into a governor's or legislator's or even university president's office and say, you know, <clears throat> the reason we need liberal education in this country is because we need fewer people like you which is what I'm sometimes tempted to say, which is why I, I'm not a lobbyist, or, right? I mean, I don't mean to be uh, flippant about it. Best I can say is you try to model it. And you try, you, you, you talk to people whose children have had a transformative experience in college. You talk to parents who are not only concerned with what the kid's income is gonna be at age 25 or age 28, which is a perfectly legitimate concern, but also they love it when their child comes home with light in her eyes and that got excited by a subject that she hadn't thought about before or even known before. And there are a lot of people like that out there. Um, and I've been very touched as I, it is true that I've spoken to a lot of different audiences though overwhelmingly, I, if I'm honest, I'm preaching to the choir most of the time. 
So maybe there's some utility in that, in that, you know, there's a certain uh, function for the sermon that is designed to strengthen the faith of the faithful <laughs> rather than to convert people. But conversion is a nice thing if and when it happens. But it's been very moving to me to go around the country to uh, community colleges, to historically black institutions, to meet young people who are often the first in their families to go to college. I have a little anecdote in the afterword to the paperback edition of this book, which I really didn't make up. Um, I gave a talk at a college in Savannah, Georgia, and a young African-American woman came up to me with two copies of the book for me to sign, and that, authors love that, right? Yeah. So she said, would you sign this one for me, please, which I did, and then she, would you sign this one for my little sister? because I really want her to go to college like me. And she wasn't talking about, I want her to get job X or job Y. She was having a mind-opening, life-enhancing experience, and she wanted the same for her, for her sibling. So you, you go and you look for those people, and you, and you, 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 tr you try to give them the, the, the determination to pursue the kind of education that they want, and uh, as for the rest of it, uh, as I say, let's have a growing economy. When you have a growing economy, then people relax about the other stuff and they allow a little more exploration in the lives of, of young people. I can't do better with it than that. I mean, I should say there are some utilitarian arguments that can be brought to bear, which, I mean, one of the paradoxes, I'll get to you in one second, sorry, it, that I take note of is that as, a, as the United States seems to be retreating from its commitment to liberal education, large parts of the rest of the world are discovering it. So in Hong Kong, for instance, they, they, they abandoned the three-year system and went to a four-year system because they don't want their students specializing so early. And why? Because they look and they say, hey, you know what? The Americans seem to have something figured out in the 20th century. Well, there are all these people who win Nobel Prizes in physics and neuroscience and so on, they studied literature and history in college as well. They got this broad general education and it helped them make connections among things and it feeds creativity. And there, there is that awareness out there. Uh, you know, and the CEOs will all say, I don't want employees who have this, this skill and that skill. I want employees who have imagination. Now, whether the human resources office knows that or not is another question. <laughs> I used to have a fairly uh, unexamined conventional view that, again, I don't mean to attribute this view to you, but it was raised by your question, that, oh, these places are wasting all this money on all these amenities. And there is a lot of waste on, a lot, on, on amenities. There's no question about it. I was trashing one of our buildings today in lecture when we were, I take every opportunity to trash things in my lectures, even though I have nothing to do with the topic. But, but I had a change of heart about that when I visited a comprehensive public institution in the middle of Michigan. And most of the students there were, Af not most, but a lot of African-American students, a lot of first-generation students who lived in places like Flint. And they were on this campus, and there was this fabulous student center, which was, I mean, it's not quite what you mean by beauty, I suppose, but it was good architecture. It had big, you know, vast windows looking out onto this nice rolling landscape, and it had a lot of food choices. And I suddenly realized, you know what, for these kids, this is a great experience because it says to them that the people of the state of Michigan actually care about them and want them to have an experience that they had never come close to having uh, at home. So there is a place for amenities and certainly a place for um, nature. I mean, the American college campus historically has been built on a hill overlooking a, a green expanse, or when they moved, finally started doing it in California, overlooking the, the ocean, uh, which all goes, you know, goes with my Melvillian thing about contemplation. It's great to be able to sit under a tree for a couple of hours uh, and maybe not even read a book, just sit under the tree, um, because these are not opportunities that you're going to have so much of uh, later in life. We're, we're still, despite our problems, a highly prosperous society where most of us can't even begin to imagine the kinds of deprivation that <clears throat> many people in the rest of the world have to deal with. So one of the things that goes along with that is we take a lot for granted. And for a middle-class kid in the United States today, college is taken for granted. There may be some question, do I go to a private one or a public one? Or a, 
secular one or a sectarian one, but it's kind of an assumption for most middle class families that you're going to go to college and it can feed the attitude that you've just suggested. So the, the best I can do with that, and I'm sure it happens here at Holy Cross all the time, is that faculty and the academic leadership need to, and I'm sure do, do everything possible to convey to students that this is really a special, spectacular opportunity in your life and that you're cheating yourself if you don't take full advantage of it. Not everybody's gonna to listen to that message, but if the message is loud and clear, some will hear it. And uh, I mean, I assume that the function of this lecture series has something to do with, with this, that to reinforce the significance of the liberal arts education so that it is not something to be taken for granted. I mean, I'm, I'm, creature of habit. And I teach a course in American uh, literature that looks very much the same as it did when I first started teaching it 30 years ago. The, the texts, sometimes one gets substituted for another. Um, but I'm not afraid of presentism. I mean, I, uh, I'm, I'm not afraid, you know, it was just teaching Jefferson uh, a few weeks ago in that course. And in a way that was not the case when I first taught Jefferson, his attitudes toward immigrants jump out. As do, of course, his attitudes toward race, uh, which when I was studying Jefferson in college didn't get much attention. So, I mean, it's one of the characteristics of enduring texts that they are in dialogue with the moment, whatever is going on in the moment. I mean, I'm, when I get to Moby Dick, which is a book about a guy who persuades the crew that they should follow him to catastrophe, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not predicting, I'm not predicting that that's where we're headed, but it's certainly a fact of life that many college students are worried about the possibility that that's where we're headed and have very... Uh, uneasy feelings about the present leadership. So suddenly that book, I think, will have a new resonance. Um, I, you know, uh, that's kind of the best I can do. I mean, I do teach different subjects sometimes, some areas that I used to do, but in, in that meat and potatoes course, the texts, the texts rise to the occasion. They allow themselves to become part of the contemporary dialogue. Again, I got no crystal ball. Uh, I can say that, that the, the demise and the large-scale uh, disappearance of institutions of, of liberal arts colleges have been predicted for a long time, and it hasn't happened yet. And I think it's plausible that as <clears throat> the larger institutions become more and more anonymous and impersonal, that well-managed liberal arts colleges will actually have a stronger market position than they, than they have had in recent years. So I'm not ready to write the obituary for the liberal arts college. But to your, to your second point, um, I think it's more likely that liberal arts colleges will look less and less like what we think of as a liberal arts college as time goes by. Uh, and I think we have to be kind of okay with that. Um, I don't, I think in academia we tend to think a little bit too much in terms of pure, you know, what are you majoring in? Or how many philosophy majors do we have? How many English majors do we have? And is that some kind of measure of the, whether we're delivering liberal education? We need engineers. We need liberally educated engineers. We need people in the health sciences who don't think about patients as statistics and revenue generators, but as people. So I don't have a problem with liberal arts institutions introducing uh, more direct opportunities for students to enter this field or that field, as long as they don't abandon their responsibility to uh, make sure that these students are exposed to the questions that are raised by liberal education. And that gets into the debates that I'm sure you're having here about curriculum and hiring lines and all the rest of it, and every place is different in that regard. My place is very peculiar because we've got this two-year core curriculum of great books that the president of the university doesn't understand and the people with the green eye shades think is too expensive 
and, and the students grumble about, although they tend to like it by the time they've gone through it, but the alumni are ferociously loyal to it. And every time there's a, there's a threat to what we call the core curriculum, the alumni walk into the president's office and they say, you know, I was reading in the in this paper about you thinking of doing away with the core curriculum, and it's funny, I, I can't find my wallet. I knew where... I knew where it was, I knew where it was last last week, but I can't find it. But you know, get back to me when the core is back on a good good foundation, and then I have a feeling I'll know where it is again. So I'm just you know, so we're in a fortunate position, and, and because we have this curriculum, the students don't find it weird that one of the things you do in college is study history and political political philosophy and read literature, even if you're uh, an engineering student or a computer science major. Uh, or, or an uh, econo economics major intending to become an investment banker. You still have to read those books, and they seem to be okay with it. Yeah. You know, it's a great question. I don't have a, I, I, it's not something I've studied. I mean, I'm as aware as everybody else of this wild grade inflation, which it's my impression is less pronounced in the hard sciences than in the, so in the social sciences and in the humanities. Um, uh, and uh, I think it is true we've gotten to the point where, you know, in the my, a field like mine, everybody gets the same grade within a narrow, uh, within a narrow range. I don't know how it, pardon? You're pretty tough for you? Well, congratulations. That's good for you. Um, but great, you know, GPA, whether you're at a great inflated place or not great inflated place, has never been my favorite measure of uh, who a student is. I'm much more interested in how a student writes, what a student uh, says in, a con in conversation, and what an honest faculty member whom I trust says about the student. So, you know, I don't pay attention to the G. I mean, if I see a lot of C minuses and Ds, I, you know, the, 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 the rate, the, the antenna, I go up. And if I see nothing but A's and A pluses, I get suspicious too, right? So, you know, I don't know what to say about great inflation. It's here, um, and uh, it's one of the reasons I don't love this student. You do student evaluations of all your faculty, right? I'm not a big fan. I mean, I think students should have a right to express their view of whether the faculty are meeting their responsibilities. But, you know, one generator of great inflation is that uh, students like the course better if they good, get a good grade. <laughs> so, anyway, that's a whole other subject which if I go into it, will uh, disappear into the quicksand. Um, maybe one more, if anybody has one more question. Everyone here majors in two things? Oh, oh, you mean not two, spe two particular things, but two different, two things. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't, I should have done some homework and studied your curriculum and how it works here. I mean, I will tell you from my vantage point as, uh, you know, looking out on the larger landscape, I think curricular incoherence is a huge problem. The proliferation of courses, uh, partly because faculty just like to teach what they're interested in, and also partly because one of the ways you advertise the attractiveness of your institution to st prospective students is to say, wow, we got all this stuff where, you know, you could take this, that, or the other thing. I, I think a little more, a little more narrowness and a little more, um, uh, coercion is, is, is not a bad thing. And, you know, every place comes to terms with that problem on its own, but it's becoming, a it's becoming a cost problem because if you have this huge curriculum, you've got to hire people to teach it. Um, and so uh, I recommend, if you can possibly do it, um, narrowing, narrowing the range, at least at the, at the opening of the funnel. One, one last question from a student, perhaps? I hate standardized tests. Uh, I suppose you, they tell you something. But as far as I know, the, the, only correl the only sound correlations between SAT scores and anything else is, number one, they predict uh, how you do in your first semester of your freshman year. That's it. And they correlate with family income. If you come from a, a well-to-do family, you're going to get a higher test score. I mean, you know, some test score in the basement might tell you something, and some test score that's like totally perfection might tell you something. But everything in between is, I think, pretty bogus. And I have a lot of students with really high test scores who can't write their way out of a paper bag. So, um, you know, and, and they're part of the competitive thing, right? Because we want to be, we, we have a you know, higher percentage of students in the top 2% of their high school class than the college down the road and so on. Um, 
doesn't doesn't do much for me. Well, honestly, I mean, I think you're you're, you're right. And again, just uh, on a level of banal generality, every institution needs to find whatever ways it can to encourage, if not coerce, students to have contact with students they wouldn't necessarily choose to have contact with. Uh, one of the best ways to do that is to have a required curriculum because then students are randomly assigned to these classes and they're all reading the same books. It doesn't have to be a two-year curriculum. It could be, I mean, there's a place called Ursinus College in Collegeville, Pennsylvania that has a just a one track for the freshman class where all the freshmen read the same books and they're all in small discussion sections and they can't choose whom they're going to class with and they can't segregate themselves according to topic because they're all reading the same thing. Uh, you can overdo it, but for whatever it's worth, I mean, it's usually, it's a miracle if the faculty can agree to institute such a curriculum, but miracles happen, right? Listen, thank you all very, very much and have a great evening. Yeah.